morning. morning. I have the pleasure of introducing my beautiful wife. And uh, I noticed that she used our scripture from <coughs> some of our vows. I don't know if she remembered that or not, but. <laughs> uh, man, I mean, it's a lot to say about this woman. I mean, it started all back in 2015. And God has just been writing it in the history books ever since. And she has been a woman that is resilient, a woman that is consistent and persistent, not only in her own desires, but the desire to go after and um, have a heart after God. She is a woman that is able to speak wisdom even when she doesn't realize it. She is able to see things that many others are not able to see. And she is an awesome woman that knows, she knows what she wants and she knows what she's going after and she accomplishes that. And I, I commend her for this and I'm thankful to be called her husband and to be a part of seeing just how much she's been able to grow and turn around uh, just in a few years of us um, dating and being married and being here to this day. And I, I'm just honored and uh, God knows that she is an answer prayer. She has been an answer prayer for me even when we first started dating and I realized it and it's, it's been a blessing to be a part of her being able to help me grow as well and just seeing how much she's able to help others grow around her. She is full of life even when she doesn't feel like she is. She is worth it. She is wonderful and an amazing woman that She'll, she'll never let you down. She will always be sure to help you to find insight in things that you never thought you would be able to see them in those ways. And it's just a joy to be able to call her my wife and for her to be the mother of our, our first child and just for us to be able to grow to be a family and not only a family, just to be a family, but a family of God. And this is a very uh, beautiful, amazing uh, woman of God that uh, I'm, I'm uh, proud of and I appreciate her being able to come up here today and share her knowledge and her work with you all. So without further ado, Kim. <laughs> Thank you for that beautiful introduction. So fun fact, did you know that female elephants in the wild are known as fierce protectors. And when one of their sisters is suffering, they circle up around her. They close in tight. They watch guard and even kick dust around her to mask her um, vulnerable scent from predators. We, as women, in the body of Christ are the same as these elephants in the wild. This is who we are. This is who we are called to be for each other. Sometimes we're the one in the middle and sometimes we're the one kicking the dust with fierce, fierce love. But the circle remains. <coughs> you can advance the slide. Sisterhood is vital to the life of any woman that has ever walked the face of the earth. In my opinion, I feel like it's the best connection and camaraderie that God has ever put on my path. I love my husband, but the, I am a strong believer that when you have sisters to walk life with, women just understand each other on a different level. And we need that. Some people, they're born with sisters and other people have close friends that are like sisters. I've been blessed to have both. So I have 
four sisters. I grew up with three of my sisters. We have the same mother and father. And uh, my older sister, she her name's Lynette. She is the protector of the family. She's I kind of call her like I like to compare people to dogs. I really am a lover of dogs, and she's like a pit bull that never changed families. And she's just so loyal and protects and just makes sure um, that her siblings are taken care of and everybody in the family is taken care of. I can always rely on her um, to give me knowledge about traveling. She loves to travel. She is a God-fearing woman. I can rely on her to pray for me and things of that nature. And I love her. And then my second older sister, her name's Gracie. She has infinite wisdom. Life has brought her through many ups and many downs. And through it all, she has a smile on her face. She's the comedian of the family. And she can make everybody laugh. And despite herself having a bad day, like she just knows how to bring a smile to other people's faces. And I can always come to her and be honest about things that I'm going through. And it's just a sweet uh, relationship we have. We both love football very much. So during football season, we are, we lean on each other for, you know, to talk about football. <laughs> and my younger sister, her name's Janelle, and she is very positive. Um, I can come to her and she can always find the sil silver lining in any situation. And she will be in a situation where she has a flat tire and all these things are going wrong and I'll talk to her on the phone and you can't even tell all those things have transpired in her life. And so I can come to her and know that my spirit will be filled and she is a true edifier and I love her for that. So in this Christian walk, we are not meant to walk alone. We need one another for support, for love, for encouragement, and to grow in our faith in God. Our horizontal relationships are just as vital as our vertical relationships as a Christian. The Bible gives us insight. <laughs> the Bible gives us insight on the warm spirit one should embody between one sister in Christ to another. And it shows us how one soul can greatly benefit from having close bonds with women of faith. Let's look at these three friendships in the Bible and see what they can teach us about how we should treat each other on a daily basis. So Mary and Elizabeth. I love their relationship. They essentially share a bond of faith and they're both pregnant. Their close friendship and faith affirm what God has willed for their life. So in the beginning of Luke, we see that Gabriel has sent, has came to Mary and told her that she's going to be conceiving a child um, by way of the Holy Spirit. And she accepts the message and she has faith in the message and she's just super excited. And then we have Elizabeth who is um, told to, we see that she's barren. She's older than a, Mary, and she also gets the same message that she's going to have a son, and she accepts it with glee and gladness. So after Mary finds out about her um, 
after Mary finds out that she's pregnant, she goes on a journey to Judea. And sometimes when we read the Bible, we it's, a phrase can be so quick and we don't realize the actual time that is um, being read in that quick phrase. But it tells us that Mary went to the hills of hill country of Judea. And that was about a three day journey alone. And she was by herself. She's just got this message. Um, she's in her younger twenties, but it showed the urgency to make the trip. In their friendship, you can advance the slide. In their friendship, they have an intergenerational relationship. Mary is younger, probably in her 20s, and some comment, commentaries say that um, Elizabeth was around maybe 80 years old. And as soon as Mary comes into the home of Elizabeth, Elizabeth quickly gives her affirming words and tells her, Blessed out the, our Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. She greets Mary. Notice that she greets Mary with the same salutations as the angel Gabriel. So we don't know the thought process Mary had. We don't know if she maybe on the way was doubting or worried because she was betrothed to <coughs> Joseph. And um, betrothed is pretty much engaged to be married and usually around those times it was about a year before the wedding actually took place so we don't know her thought process maybe she was excited when she heard the message but on her way on that three-day journey her mind and everything started to get to her we don't know and so as soon as she saw Elizabeth Elizabeth greeted her and she quickly affirmed her another cool thing that I noticed Oh, you, you can stay right there. Another cool thing that I noticed is that there was no jealousy displayed. We, the Bible never tells us if um, Elizabeth was, you know, <clears throat> jealous or comparing herself. Because mind you, she's also pregnant, but she's pregnant at a much later date, age than um, Mary is. She's rejoicing with her. She's encouraging her. She's uplifting her and giving her wisdom. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, and right after she encouraged her, Mary has a praise called the Magnificat, which is a beautiful song that we sing today in church. She stayed in Elizabeth's home for three months. And in those three months, you could imagine that they probably unburdened their hearts to each other. If you ever had a friend, there's some times where I talk to my friend on the phone and Two hours later, we're still talking, mm -hmm. and we're just unpacking everything that's been going in our going on in our life since the last time we talked to each other. And it's just an edifying experience to have um, that with a friend. She was Elizabeth was six months by the time of her arrival, and so she um, Mary stayed for three months. And so during that time, you could imagine that. Um, she was helping Elizabeth in the home and she was, they were just using that time to uplift one another, using that time to, cause again, Zacharias, Elizabeth's husband, he wasn't able to speak. So imagine your whole pregnancy, you can't talk to your husband cause he can't talk. And you have nobody to really lean on, you know. And God provided that relationship for Elizabeth. And so not only was Elizabeth giving wisdom to Mary, she was, um, Mary was helping Elizabeth as well. So God knows what we need. He knows exactly what we need. And... They knew with God, nothing was impossible. Proverbs, I love this. 
I love this proverb. It says, gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Pleasant words are a sweet thing. Note, but notice its effect. Sweet to the soul and healing to the body. We as humans, we're two-dimensional. We're spirit and body. And words bring healing. Elizabeth and Mary loved and understood each other. And they had the same belief in God. They were women of triumphal faith, accepting God's plan for their lives and their son's lives. We don't know if they had any premonitions of what was to come in their son's lives. But as we read on into the Bible, we see that Jesus was destined to die on a throne and John the Baptist was destined to be beheaded. So maybe because God, God knew what was going to happen, he helped cultivate and establish that relationship from pregnancy. They were able to rely on each other during pregnancy and maybe even after those things occurred with their sons. The next friendship, the next friendship transcends cultures. A Moab woman married into an Israelite family and was motivated by love and loyalty to stay with her mother-in-law. This story of Ruth and Naomi begins near the end of the judges in the Old Testament. This story goes from gut-wrenching grief to glad, heartening triumph in only 85 verses. We see within this friendship that love is not limited by the type of relationship between two people. So a brief over overview of this story there was a famine in Bethlehem. So a family of two sons and their wives and their mother and father uh, moved to live in Moab. And a lot of commentaries mention how Moab, you can advance the slide, is very deserted. So there wasn't a lot of, there was a famine going on in Bethlehem and to, how would I want to say, to go to Moab probably wasn't the best plan B. However, it was the closest place and they had um, <coughs> probably some ties there. Going back to, I believe it's Genesis, Moab is a tribe that was bred off of the incest of Lot and his daughters. And so, although they, is the Bethlehem and Moab have, have close ties, they are not very fond of each other. And so they go to Moab and, and within a 10 year span, Naomi's sons passed away and her husband passes away as well. This leaves three widows without any man. In those times, and even still today, men are like protection. And so if you're a woman that's not married or a widow, you're kind of vulnerable and just not protected, out for whatever. Um, and so, Naomi is telling her daughter-in-laws to go back to their homes, to their mothers, so they can marry again. Moab was a, a tribe, a people that they worshiped other gods. They had idols and things of that nature. Naomi was from a place where she tr they served the true and living God. 
But you see in the story that Orpha and Ruth, they don't want to leave their mother-in-law. And to me, that shows that the love that Naomi showed her daughters-in-law must have been so great and so vast because they didn't want to leave her. They wanted to stick beside her. But despite that, she was like, just go home, just go home. And Orpha ends up leaving. Orpa ends up leaving. However, we see that Root stayed behind. Root pledged, had a pledge of devotion to Naomi. And that showed that Naomi must have been very lovable to Root. And uh, Ruth 1, 16 through 17, 16 through 18, you can advance the slide. It reads, and I just want to read this because it shows the passion in Ruth's voice and it shows just the determination in her voice that she was adamant about not leaving Naomi's side. But Ruth replied, so this is Ruth 1 verses 16 through 18. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. And those few verses is a testimony of her personal faith, of the personal faith from the lips of a young woman in a pagan culture that was raised in a pagan culture. Because in the book of Ruth, it mentions at least five times, you can advance the slide, five times that she was a Moab woman, that she was a stranger. Um, it, it quotes Ruth the Moab, the woman of Moab, Moab, Moabitish damsel and stranger. So it's emphasized. She doesn't belong here. She's not from where we're from. She's not our people, but she was determined to stick by her side, her mother-in-law Naomi's side. Some women today, like Orpa, and no fault to their own, would have chose to go back home. Maybe they would have thought, the mother of my, of my first husband is in my way. I gotta get married, I gotta be protected again. I'm young and I want to marry again, may have been the thoughts. But Ruth, she stuck close. You can advance the slide. Cho she chose to stick by her mother-in-law, Naomi, with grace. Once she made that choice, they took about a 120 mile journey back to Bethlehem. Can you go back a couple slides, sorry. So that's about a 120 mile journey. So imagine two women, one younger, one older, lot going on a long, fatigued, and dangerous trail to go back to Bethlehem, especially for two widowed women with no man to guard them and a lack of resources. This probably caused them to cling even closer together and have a stronger bond. Let me advance the slide to Romans. Romans 12.10 tells us, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. We see Ruth displaying this so beautifully towards her mother-in-law. Ruth's Naomi, uh, 
uh, wit the witness of Naomi and her family must have left a powerful impression on Ruth to want to follow her mother-in-law to her homeland. This uh, sisterhood, this friendship displays sisterhood in times of grief and empathy. Ruth, as I mentioned, followed her mother-in-law with a spirit of love. Can you go back one slide? Ruth did not criticize Naomi in her despair, but she was patient. If you look at Ruth chapter 1, verse 20 to 21, we see Naomi say this. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life bitter, and I went away full. But the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So even with Ruth staying with her, her thoughts were clouded. She felt alone. Her son died. Her, her sons died. Her husband died. She was in a state of, we could call it depression. But just by Ruth staying loyal to her and sticking by her side, God worked used Ruth to turn their situation around. And she met Boaz working the field and eventually got married and had a son. And we see in Ruth 4, 15 through 16, how Naomi's bitterness turned into praise due to worship. And it reads, he will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. That's such a beautiful thing. That Ruth was allowed to, was, God used Ruth in order to turn their situation around from being poor, being widowed, and not having anywhere to turn, to having heirs of sons being born and them being uh, married into a rich family. And a, a cool thing that I noticed in my study is Ruth's name is actually, means friendship. So she, embody her name in this story, which is a beautiful thing. So this next friendship is not a sister friend dynamic. However, these two young men in the Bible teach us a lot of what it looks like to truly love your neighbor as yourself, no matter how different they, meet, they may be from you. You can advance the slide. So Jonathan and David, Jonathan and David exemplify a covenant friendship. While most men in Jonathan's shoes would have felt jealous or threatened, Jonathan saw the God in David. Jonathan and David came from two very different backgrounds. David was a shepherd, Jonathan was a prince. David used a harp and a slingshot, and Jonathan had his own armor. David grew up in a little town of Bethlehem and was trained to tend the sheep, and Jonathan grew up in a palace and was trained in the art of war. David was the youngest of eight boys and anointed to, the next, to be the next king in the palace of Jonathan. And Jonathan was the oldest in his line of siblings to inherit the throne. David was a part of the tribe of Judah and Jonathan was part of the tribe of Benjamin. However, despite their differences, they had some very core things in common. And some of those things were that 
They were both warriors. In 1 Samuel 13, chapter 13 and 14, we see Jonathan um, and his armor bearer killed 20 men, Philistine, Philistine men. <laughs> and they both were men of faith who served the living God. They both provided courage, God-given courage and strength. And they both needed each other. Jonathan was an honest man, and he was willing to face death as a result. We see that in a story of Samuel 14, 1 Samuel 14, where he eats the honey and Saul is telling him, what did you do? And he tells him exactly what he did. Um, and he was supposed to die in that moment, but his life was spared due to his honesty. So Jonathan is unlike his father, Saul. He's a God-fearing man. He's not jealous. And he's a good friend to David. Their covenants that they shared were unilateral, meaning affecting one person. Jonathan committed himself totally to his friend who he most likely befriended when he was serving King Saul. He recognized that God's um, anointed, that he was God's anointed future king. And on one occasion, can you uh, to advance two slides? Yep. On one occasion, he makes a covenant with David, stripping himself from his robe and his armor and giving it all to him. With, and it's cool to think because Jonathan doesn't know the future. He probably wasn't told that David was going to be uh, the king of Israel. Maybe he just felt it, something about him. Because after David... After David goes to battle with Goliath, something sparks in Jonathan to draw closer to him. Jonathan's willingness to confer his right to the throne is a remarkable display of self-sacrificing love. And on multiple occasions, Jonathan saves David from his father's demise and jealousy. Jonathan makes a second covenant with David in 1 Samuel 20 because of his loyal love for him, promising David he will do anything. Jonathan realized after so many occasions of saving David from his father that his dad's jealousy and anger was not going to go away. And so he decides to help Jonathan to flee. I mean, to help David to flee. And there's one last time. Oh, also, Jonathan asked David to show kindness and mercy to his family, which David gladly does in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Throughout their friendship, we see that Jonathan loved David like he loved himself. And when he seeks to take, when he seeks to help uh, David flee. And their last time we see them together in the Bible, Jonathan encourages David and puts himself under David. He says in 1 Samuel 23, you can go back. 1 Samuel 23, verses 16 through 18. This is Jonathan's last words to David. And it states, 
And Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Horish and helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will second to you. Even my father knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. Then Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horish. And you could go back. Their friendship display how within our sisterhood, sisters in Christ, we should love one another like we love ourselves. Jonathan's life is an example of true friendship and character that was spoiled by his father's insane jealousy and rage against his dear friend. The story of David and Jonathan is one of great friendship. Jonathan went through great lengths to protect David from his father, and David looked after Jonathan's children long after he was dead. So, another beautiful friendship that we see in the Bible no jealousy, no comparison, just encouragement, protection, and just affirming what God has put in uh, that person. Can advance the slide. Each friendship in the Bible that we talked about today exemplify how we are to love one another, encourage one another within the body of Christ. Romans 12 verse 5 tells us that the body of Christ, as, as the body of Christ, we are members of one another. So we must know and believe that we are not meant to run the race of faith alone. So how do we go about showing love and kindness to our sisters? There have been many ways that sisterhood and the body of Christ has been shown to me. A few examples shown to me during my time here at SIBI. A couple examples I can think of are after the birth of my one year, now one-year-old son, Celia set up a meal a train for me and my husband. So we didn't have to worry about meals and things of that nature during the first couple uh, months of our son being here. And that was a great blessing because all the food was good <laughs> and <laughs> we didn't have to cook or spend money. And so... It was a blessing. And another example is our son Greg, while Ozias was still a few months old, still very in his baby stage, would watch him on a few Friday occurrences so that I could rest and I can have time with Josh and we could just gather our brains around being new parents and all those things. And so those few hours were so sweet to me and I'm super grateful that that took place. And I'm a person that I don't always ask for help and that's one of my weaknesses and something I'm growing at. And so to have people just offer help was a great blessing. Another, um, time during another instance during that same time of being a new parent is Alana helping me uh, offering to do housework and helping to fold clothes and wash dishes um, in my home and that's just something she just offered to do and it just gave me li lifted up um, a burden off of my shoulder that I didn't have to worry about or think about. She just stepped in. And so some practical ways that this can be done on, in a 
congregational level is if you're creative, you can make gift box, gift bags or gift boxes or anything like gift related or crafts and to give to your sister, fellow sisters in the congregation. I know people love gifts and just giving a gift just because will brighten somebody's day. Um, babysitting because parents need their time to date and be together is another thing that a church can offer as a congregation or that can be offered within sisters um, directly on an individual basis. Helping women clean, whether it be just having a baby or illness or a widow or elderly in the church, um, you know, setting up a day maybe once a month or once a term, once a quarter, where you're picking somebody to help in that way. Um, as women, it, the Bible says we're supposed to be keepers of the home and as much as, you know, people want to be good at that all the time, sometimes, you know, house gets chaotic and we need help of our sisters to get it back in order. Sending flowers is always a good idea and cards to women in the church, whether they be ill, elderly, widowed, or have a new baby. Um, just be, knowing that someone else is thinking about you is always like heartwarming. Um, something that can be done on an individual basis that you can do today, and I can do today as well, is affirm God's will in her life. Sometimes we don't always see the gifts that God has placed on our heart. Sometimes we don't always see and notice the God's love for us. And sometimes we need to be affirmed. And those words, just like the Proverbs tells us, will help heal that sister. Having a coffee date or a dinner date. Everybody, I love food and anytime it's fellowship um, with food being involved, like that's a good time. So dinner date, coffee date, um, then just time to unwind and be girls, you know, it's a good thing to do. Making time for meaningful conversation. We are always in this constant hustle and bustle in life as students, as mothers, as wives, as friends. And when you make time to have meaningful conversation with each other, it shows that you care and that you're on this journey like Elizabeth and Mary and Ruth and Naomi with your fellow sister in Christ. And just make yourself open to help, to helping your sister in any way you can. Can you advance the slide? So, life can be very challenging. So we need our sisters in Christ around us to edify us when the, the narrow path is rocky and we want to give up. We also need our sisters in, in Christ to celebrate with us during happy times in our lives. Um, that's very important also. The gift of sisterhood, the gift that sisterhood provides transcends age, upbringing, and tribes, or in today we probably think of that as race. The gift of sisterhood transcends all those things because once you are in Christ, you belong to a body of believers. In this case, particularly women of faith that you are now connected to. These women will encourage, love, and advise you to keep your eyes on the cross and help you to find strength in God. We need each other to stay focused on the reward. Thank you.